Welcome to EDUC 1635 Maths 1, uh, or the subtitle is uh, Introduction to Mathematics Teaching. My name is David Hewitt. I'm going to be your lecturer for this, uh, for this unit. And for the next 13 weeks, we're going to go on a journey where hopefully you're going to become um, going to have a new appreciation for mathematics, particularly as it relates to teaching to students. But um, before we go any further, just a really quick introduction to myself. Um, yes, I'm a Fremantle Football Club supporter and tragic. And I guess just like maths, um, sometimes being a member of Freo takes quite a lot of perseverance in terms to get to the outcomes that you want. And certainly in the mathematics uh, that we're going to be undertaking, there's going to be some perseverance that's required as well. Um, my career has been fairly extensive in education, so fairly quickly I've started off my career as a teacher and then as a principal in West Australian government schools and then um, worked in independent schools as a principal, then I worked internationally as a principal and also as an education consultant. But um, pretty much throughout that journey I had always maintained an interest in mathematics and during that sort of second third of my career I worked at ECU and at UWA on various elements of the mathematics curriculum there and also worked a little program um, with a lady called Kelly Norris called Good Start which was around um, making an early journey into the mathematics learning for early years and then also worked with Paul Swan who hopefully you'll end up hearing a little bit more around and uh, we looked at it setting up this entity called Maths Club. The third third of my career continued on uh, working in uh, around education. I was in schools but also working at the West Australian, um, West Australian Primary Principals Association in lots of roles. Um, but also during this time in these later years I've been still involved in mathematics, teaching and learning, working at Murdoch and also at, at Notre Dame. So that's a little bit about me. Um, in terms of the content for the course, some of the key contacts you're going to need to understand and, and to be able to contact are Tracy and Linda as the program coordinators and possibly more often uh, Jenny who's going to be the course coordinator. <clears throat> I'm the lecturer of course and I'll be taking a, a Thursday tute and then of course there's the other, tutor, the other tutors who will be working with you. So now I've taken my uh, talking head off, we can now get into the content. So some of the key dates, now this is in your um, handbook of course, but just to, to reinforce, um, the lectures commence on Monday the 24th of July of that week and they end the week ending mon uh, the Monday the 23rd of October. All the lectures are going to be pre-recorded and they'll be made available on the Monday morning of each week, if not slightly before, but I'm not going to release uh, lectures before that time. Attendance at tutorials is vital. It's really important that you attend the tutorials. It's not just the fact of turning up, but there's lots of practical knowledge that you're going to be given and lots of opportunities to actually help you develop your own learning of mathematics as well as understanding the key pedagogies and methodologies involved in teaching mathematics. Um, you get rewarded by having a break week around the, the 18th of September. Now the most important thing I guess, not in my minds, but in students minds obviously is around the assessments and there are three parts to it. There's the presentation that you'll do uh, in week nine, there'll be more of that a little bit later. There's a competency test in week 11 and you'll get a chance to do some practices of that and that's worth 25% of your marks, so that's a quarter of your marks there. And then there's an examination in that week 16 to 17 November. So having said that, this is not about assessment. Uh, my friend Paul Swan, who I spoke to you about earlier, he always said nobody ever got taller by being measured. So we're not trying to assess um, you overly here, but we do have to demonstrate that you're going to have some practical skills in the, the knowledge and teaching of mathematics as, 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 as described in the handbook anyway. Uh, let's keep going. So some of the key content you're going to be covering, um, you're going to be looking at uh, the overview of mathematics and mathematical learning. We're going to be talking about what numeracy is. We're going to be looking at the curriculum as it's described for all Australian schools and particularly in Western Australia. We're going to be looking at this term called constructivism and what does that mean and how does it relate to the learning of mathematics. Um, we're going to be looking at lesson planning for you as well so that when you go on prax you'll be able to have a really strongly structured lesson um, with clear goals and outcomes and activities in there. And then the, the maths part of it, which uh, you might be a little bit nervous about, um, is fairly straightforward. We're going to be looking at the, these early skills of counting, 
partitioning. There's a particularly uh, mathematical word, and you're going to learn lots of language of mathematics, and I'll particularly be talking about that a little bit more in terms of what the language of mathematics is and the need to teach it explicitly. We're going to be looking at place values, operations such as you know addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, etc. We're going to look at what that means by calculating, and then we're going to be delving into some problem solving. So hopefully this journey is going to be uh, enjoyable for you and um, one that you're really going to become engaged in. I'm going to start off with this word, disposition. Um, and disposition, as they're described there by the Cambridge Dictionary, is a person's usual way of feeling or behaving, or the tendency of a person to be happy, friendly, anxious, etc. So if I was to say to you that uh, I love mathematics and I really enjoy the beauty of it, it's got a real art to it, there's a pattern and a regularity to it. I love being able to solve problems using mathematical thinking. I love to think like a mathematician. Um, my disposition towards mathematics is very positive and has been basically all my life. I'm imagining that some of you, you might be uh, sitting there or standing there listening to this lecture, thinking coming into a mathematics lecture and your knees might be shaking, you might be sweating, your heart might be beating really fast because um, perhaps you've not had a really strong uh, success rate, if I could put it that way, in, in your own thinking of your description of you as a mathematical uh, learner or learner of mathematics. We've got to really start to put that aside because as teachers you're going to be going into the classroom and you're going to be teaching this subject of mathematics and you've got to bring a positive disposition to it because if you go into the classroom and you know say to the students oh look don't worry i was never very good at mathematics we don't expect you to be what do you think their learning is going to be like of course they're not going to be achieving a little later on in this uh, in this lecture we're going to be talking about something called a growth mindset and i need you to take on a growth mindset straight away particularly if your disposition towards mathematics or mathematics learning or mathematics teaching is not particularly strong because the thing that's going to change the ability of the students in the classroom to be successful mathematics learners will be your disposition the positive um, uh, attitude you bring towards the lesson, the amount of pro, uh, preparation you put into the lesson so that you really understand the content that the, that the students are learning, um, the ability to, to structure learning materials so for each student's learning style so that they can maximise their opportunity to learn and understand the mathematical concepts and constructs that you're going to be uh, putting in front of them because you're the organiser for this. Yes, we want them to construct their own learning but basically you as the teacher will be organising this. So for me, the most important thing that you can bring to this mathematics unit is a really positive disposition to learning, to understanding, to practicing, and actually to, to teaching the mathematics when it comes to that point. Can't underline this, this enough. Disposition. Um, this is real. Maths phobia and maths anxiety. And as can be shown here, that many of the problems relate to bad teaching and bad learning experiences. And you might reflect on uh, who your best teachers were and who your worst teachers were. And I'm often uh, would be guessing that that relates pretty much to uh, the teachers who were bad teachers, one that couldn't relate the content to your learning style, um, who perhaps talked at you and talked talk instead of learnt with you. So again, these maths phobias and maths anxieties are real. How do we overcome that? We overcome these by having a positive disposition towards the, the learning and the teaching of mathematics. And guess where it starts? It starts with you. Having said that, um, here's something that we need to get into pretty quickly. We're going to be talking about the idea of a skills audit. Um, you can read the slide. I'm not going to read the whole thing. It's very dense. Um, but basically, um, by the, the end of August, you need to have completed this first audit. Okay. We'll talk more about Lantite later. It's a, similar to Lantite, but the audit itself, this is for you. It contains 32 questions, which you have 60 minutes to complete. This is half the size of the Lantite test, which asks you to require, uh, answer 65 questions, but in two hours. This is a practice audit for you. Um, so the audit will be checked by us, your lecturers and your tutors. And if you don't reach the, the benchmark, which is 70%, you'll be notified that you need some help to be able to pass the competency test that comes later in the unit, which I described a little bit earlier. So this is your opportunity to practice your skills with assistance. And please don't be ashamed or embarrassed if there's some content there that you don't understand. Make sure that you talk to your tutor 
because we're here to help. We want you to really understand and be really excellent teachers of mathematics. And one of those um, um, things that you need to do is to be competent with the mathematics yourself. Now we're only talking about primary school, so we're not talking about calculus and differential equations, etc. So please don't get um, too ahead of yourself in this. So that's the skills audit. Um, it doesn't count towards your final mark, so I can hear a deep sigh of relief there. Um, so this is a practice test for you. Mixture of number and algebra, measurement, geometry, statistics and probability. And we'll talk about those terms, which are the strands in the mathematics curriculum a little bit later. Um, once you start this particular test, you have to do it in one sitting. You can't be reopened, so make sure you've got that time. You've got an hour to do it. And it will be accessed through Blackboard and clicking on the assessment tab. And we'll let you know, Jenny will probably let you know uh, when this is available to you. OK, so why do we teach mathematics? What is the purpose for it in society? And one of the key things that we try to do with students is always, wherever possible, relate what the students are learning to their real life experiences. Sometimes it's a little bit more difficult than others, but if we can connect the mathematics to what happens in their life, both outside of school as well as inside school, which means some cross-curricular relationships, and obviously there's a strong relationship between mathematics and science and mathematics and music, etc. It makes those the learning for the students a little bit more connected to, to real world practice. So why do we teach mathematics? What I'd like you to do is just to write down five things that you've done today which have involved mathematics and or mathematical thinking. So I'll ask you just to stop the video and just write those things down. Have a think about it. Take your time. And when you're ready, just restart the video. Okay. So just why do we teach mathematics? Well, hopefully your list was quite extensive, but have a look at this list. Did your list uh, coincide with any of these? Managing money, such as looking at budgets, going shopping, preparing food and drinks, calculating travel distances and time, understanding loans, etc., etc. Down to that second column. Now, what sort of things do we need to know? Well, of course, if we're looking at managing money, we need to know what the money tree values are, but there's also a sense of number and quantity in there. When we're looking at shopping, we're dealing again with money. When we're preparing food and drinks, we're looking at measuring uh, volumes, capacities, weights, etc. When we're calculating travel distance, we're looking at the measurement of, of time and distance. Um, understanding loans, there's a, a whole range of number skills and operations around percentages, etc. Uh, administering medicines, and that's one way, area where we do need to be really precise with our measurements and understanding what's the difference between a milliliter and a, um, and a liter, because we wouldn't want to get those mixed up when we're administering med medicines. So there's a whole raft of raise reasons why we teach mathematics, and I hope you were able to add to that list or even just be reinforced with some of the things that are on the list itself. Um, so what's mathematics for? Uh, the Government of South Australia put out this really nice little uh, video called The Leader's Resource, and it's on YouTube. You can see the link there. Um, it'll be also on the hard copy PDF that I'll post. But for some reason, my um, video won't allow me to re-watch this video within this window. So what I'd like you to do is copy that URL, the YouTube with the number, uh, stop the video, watch the YouTube, and then when you've watched that, come back to the video. I'm sorry this is a bit clunky and I have to resolve this, but um, I can't show a video within this, this tutorial at the moment. So, as I, as I say, uh, copy the URL, stop the video, watch the, the, the YouTube video, and then come back and rejoin us. Okay, so... I, um, I hope that, uh, that you got something out of that video and you've got some understandings of what um, mathematics is about. So what are we saying is what is mathematics? Well, Handel and Harrington in 2003, a lot of years ago, 20 years ago, um, says we all have views about mathematics and these views shape our decisions about how we teach and learn mathematics. Again, if I take you back to that D word, disposition, 
if you've got a positive disposition towards teaching and learning mathematics, um, how's that going to compare if you've got a negative disposition towards that? So we all have views and opinions about mathematics. We've all had good and bad experiences with mathematics, both in school and our lives, even me. Um, and it's these um, these views which has helped shaped us, which then also shape us as teachers. And we need to be able to be conscious of that and cognizant of the, the impact that those views may well have on our students. Um, so what is mathematics? Well, it's got a whole pile of stuff that sits around it. It is certainly a powerful, precise and concise precise and concise means of communication. The language of mathematics, if you think about it, and I'll talk about it again a bit later, consists of lots of different elements. Uh, if we're learning to read, there's the sense of the letters of the alphabet, the way the sounds comes together in phonemes and digraphs, etc., the way they come together in words, and the words then come together into a sentence, and the sentence builds into a paragraph, etc., etc. But it's actually, it's all based on the, the 26 letters of the alphabet. Whereas mathematics, the language of mathematics as a means of communication is much more broad. We've actually got the words, so one, um, O-N-E, three, T-H-R-E-E, -E, but we've also got the number symbols for those, the one symbol and the three symbol. So we've got two different languages there. Then we've got a language using um, symbols such as the add symbol or the, the subtract symbol or a percentage symbol. Um, then we've got pictorial things like graphs, um, that's also a language of maths and a communication. So it's a powerful and precise and concise means of communication using multiple languages and we have to get our head around that. Mathematics is a reasoning and a creative activity and it's going to be very difficult for us and students to reason and be creative if we don't have the language with which to reason and be creative. So that goes back to my first dot point. Uh, as a reasoning and creative activity, it incorporates processes of questioning, reflecting, reasoning and proof. It's a powerful tool for solving familiar and unfamiliar problems and it's a 21st century skill. And it's about time we move past that because we're well in the 21st century now. But I want to just get back to this idea of it's a powerful tool for solving familiar and unfamiliar problems because often we think there's only ever a single solution for a mathematical problem and that's not always the case and hopefully we'll be able to break down that fallacy and that myth over these next 13 weeks. Um, yes, 3 plus 2 does equal 5 but uh, let's talk about how we can re-express that equation uh, as we develop our understanding of mathematics. So I just don't want you to think there's always only one single solution for mathematics, which is often what makes a lot of people scared about mathematics, that they're going to get it, and I'm putting my fingers up in inverted commas here, we're going to get it wrong. Nothing wrong with getting things wrong, that's a learning experience. What is mathematics? Let's keep going. Um, it's about engagement. Um, and again, your disposition will help the students achieve this. We need to get the students to a point where they feel they can be successful even when they don't succeed. So as I said earlier, it's not about being wrong as being wrong. Actually being wrong is an information feedback loop for us that we need to try again where there's another process, another strategy. Maybe we missed something in our initial um, problem solving process. Um, but we can't get students to feel that they're successful learners unless we provide that message back to them. We want students to be strong and confident mathematicians. We want them to think mathematically. We want them to be able to strategize mathematically and come up with reasons why they've chosen particular pathways or particular solutions. So again, it's up to us. It's our disposition and creating that positive disposition which then puts it onto the students themselves. Um, here's a rather sad story, a, a graph from last year um, looking at mathematics participation in school from 2008 to, to 2020 and the percentage of year 12 students on the left hand side on that graph. And again, here's a, a method of communication. I should have picked this up a little bit earlier for you. Here's a picture that we can see um, fairly steadily. If we look at the orange and we look from 2008 to uh, 2020, we can see that there's a downward trend. And if we look at the uh, the label on the left hand axis, the percentage, uh, we can see that the percentage of students studying high mathematics, the orange ones, uh, it's dropping. 
okay it's not dropping as badly as the blue but it's certainly getting less so what are we interpreting what are we communicating that over this period of time less proportion of students are studying the higher mathematics and let's have a look at intermediate mathematics in that same period and again we can see the graphs gone up and down particularly around 2018 there's a bit of a, a, a jump up but if we took a line from 2008, 23.3% down to 2020, 17.6%, we can see that there's a trend, a, a, a common element that typically the percentage of year 12 students even studying intermediate maths is dropping. So here's the level of communication. There's some interpretation. There's some knowledge we have to have around graphs. We have to understand what the graph is telling us. There's two different keys there, higher mathematics and, and intermediate mathematics. And then there's the numbers themselves. So again, a method of communication that we need to be able to interpret and explain um, for our own um, purposes. Um, so when we're looking at this by gender, uh, we can see the blue is year 12 males and the orange is year 12 females. Again, there's a tendency for both groups to be dipping slightly. Um, and then if we look at the intermediate graph on the bottom, again, typically the, that graph is going down. So what is it saying? Less numbers of students, are, well, less numbers percentage-wise anyway, smaller percentages of students are studying higher and intermediate maths over, the, over this period of time. And we need to ask ourselves, why would that be the case? Exactly why? <coughs> well, why? So evidence from the study suggests that on average, Australian female students are less engaged and more fear of, fearful of mathematics. They're less likely to pursue maths at higher levels. They're less likely to choose career pathways that involve maths and are more likely to be outperformed by their male counterparts, their male peers. And this is from Spielke, uh, Spelke, sorry, in 2005. And yet the current psychological viewpoint does not support the position of a male intrinsic aptitude for mathematics, which seems to pervade the society. But males over females, there's no um, particular aptitude gender wise for mathematics. And there's no difference in potential for females and males to achieve. So again, we need to understand what's what's happening in schools is what's the disposition I can say, possibly in secondary schools, what's the disposition of mathematics teachers towards the gender or is this something males and females are taking on as a difference from their own point of view. So once again, we've got to dispel that myth, whatever gender, there's no intrinsic aptitude for mathematics learning. So all kids can learn maths. All people can learn maths, all adults can learn maths. It's just to what particular level do they want to take it. Um, so in 2003, John Hattie, if you haven't come across him before, he's an amazing uh, educator, mathematical researcher, uh, has done some fantastic research. And back in 2003, again, in, in 20 years ago, sadly, this doesn't seem like that long, he looked at what was a, made a difference in achievement at schools. And he determined that there are six major sources of variances. The thing that made the biggest difference in, in uh, achievement were the students themselves. And you can see that by that, again, there's a pictorial graph, a pie graph, we would call that. And we don't have any numbers around that, but we could guess that around half the difference of achievement is down to the students themselves and their attitude and aptitudes. Have a look at the orange on the right, on the left hand side. That's bigger than a quarter. So let's say that's around about 30% of that variance is up to, up to teachers. So teachers do make a difference. Home life makes a difference. The students, peers, schools, and even the principal. And as an ex-principal, I'm glad to see that that's there, that we make a difference. Um, but look, the biggest um, difference in achievement is down to teachers and students. So we can get through this. Um, lots of opportunities there. Um, and then McKinsey in 2007, um, they concluded that the quality of education system cannot simply be, uh, sorry, quality of an education system simply cannot exceed the quality of its teachers. So again, let's interpret this. What they're saying is if the quality of the teachers are low, then the quality of the overall education system is, is consequently low as well. Whereas if we can have high quality teaching, high quality learning happening in the classroom, that lifts the quality of the education system as, it's, as, it's, as an entity. And um, the education system is very large, but even those small things, even if we can 
just get one teacher, if we can get all of you becoming really high quality teachers, that's going to then lift the quality of the education system and that in turn is going to lift that quality of the students that we teach that are coming out of the system. So beside the students, um, what the student brings to the table, the biggest uh, achievement in the classroom is the teacher by a considerable margin. And I think that that pie graph uh, was able to demonstrate that. Again, how do we do that? And I'm just going to repeat these slides. Um, this is about disposition. So um, again, regardless of whatever experience that you're bringing to these lectures, positive, negative or ambivalent, it's the disposition that you need to bring to your teaching and learning that will change the student's life. So if you can bring a positive disposition to your mathematics learning yourself as a student, if you can bring a positive disposition to yourself as a teacher of mathematics, that's going to have a huge impact on the ability of those students to succeed in your classroom. So your disposition is what's going to count the first step off and we've seen in those previous slides how the quality of the teacher can influence the quality of the student outcome. And let's see how you go on your first shoot. Let's see if you can walk in those doors with that positive disposition, a big smile on your face looking, I love maths. And by the end of that first shoot, you're going to be walking out of the classroom saying, I love maths even more. Um, let's see if we can make that a reality. Um, don't need to go through that. Um, Westwood, uh, this is a really interesting quote, uh, again a little bit old now but nonetheless um, really important. Uh, many intelligent people after an average of 1500 hours of instruction, if you can imagine how much that is, that's 50 weeks at least, uh, over 11 years of schooling still regard maths as meaningless for which they have no aptitude. It's difficult to imagine how a subject could have achieved for itself such an appalling image as it now has in the popular mind. To think all of our effort has led to a situation of fear and loathing is depressing. A long time ago, um, but still, as we say, there is a lot of uh, negativity around mathematics teaching and mathematics learning, and we've got to change that. Uh, it's up to you to make sure that you bring to your positive disposition to change this, that mathematics is not a meaningless activity. It has connection to real world, real world living and student interest. And there's also a beauty to mathematics. So there's so much beautiful, beautiful mathematical art out there. There's uh, mathematics and music, etc. So in the creative arts, again, it's mathematics. It's not just number. Um, so here we go. Think about this again. Just think about someone who's good at maths, uh, someone who you admire, someone you'd look at and say, oh, they're really good at mathematics. What do they do to make you think they're good at maths? You might just want to stop this and pause and have a think about this. Um, I'll just take a, a two second break and have a sip of my cup of tea. Okay, so what did you come up with? Who was that person and what did they do? Well, if that's the disposition that you admire in that person, or they're positive at maths, see if you can take on that. So um, pre-service teachers, as yourself, um, who love maths, I love that button, we should get them made, um, generally perceive maths as relating to numbers or problems and rules and procedures. Um, few people leave school with the realisation that maths is supposed to make sense. And again, that's going to be your role as a teacher to make sure that the learning of the students around the mathematics is sensible, is sense making and connected to the real world wherever possible. So how's it go so wrong? Um, it's all a bit negative at the moment, but let's get on to positive stuff shortly. Um, so virtually all young children like mathematics. So when they first come into school and you look in the early childhood classes, sorting, classifying, counting, moving, kids love mathematics. Um, um, but as they become socialised by school and society, their view of mathematics shifts from enthusiasm to apprehension and from confidence to fear. Eventually most students leave maths under duress convinced that only geniuses can learn it. And I guess that probably what's happening is some really poor teaching. We don't teach for understanding, we teach, well, we, we shouldn't be. Some people teach for, for understanding, they teach by rote, they teach by formula, um, they teach a consistent pattern so the kids can't think outside the box once that pattern is set. Um, but maths is not like that and certainly mathematics teaching is not like that and we should not allow any students to fear maths. We should not allow them to leave our classroom not feeling anything other than a confident mathematician at the level that they're able to confidently associate the maths. Um, yeah. 
Um, so here's the good news. So Carol Dweck um, has done a lot of work around this idea of mindsets and mindsets are kind of a little bit like an attitude or if I could use the D word again, perhaps a disposition. Um, so when students struggle with their schoolwork, what determines whether they give up and embrace the obstacle um, or embrace the obstacle and work to overcome it. So what mindset do you bring to your own mathematics teaching and learning? Do you are confronted with some mathematics in society or in your real life and go, oh no, it's too hard, it's maths, I was never good at it? Or do you say, oh, here's a nice little challenge, now how am I going to work around it? Well, Carol Dweck and Jaeger decided that this was around how do we change the mindset? How do we actually change our disposition, if you like? Um, so the research that showed that believing intelligence was fixed and unchangeable can lead students to interpret when they lack, when they have academic challenges, it's a sign they lack intelligence. Nothing is further from the truth. Students' mindset can be changed and that doing so can promote perseverance. Now, we're not talking about just simply, you know, awarding um, gold stars when they're not really deserved. That's not what this is about. This is actually making sure that the students have a mindset that when they are confronted with a challenge, that they have some strategies and some structures to work around or through that challenge and not just give up. So we've got to be careful that we don't misinterpret um, trying to overblow the, the praise in terms of trying to give a solution, if you like. Um, so these two implicit theories of intelligence uh, appear to create different psychological worlds for students, one that promotes perseverance and one that does not. Do we give up when we're faced with a challenge or do we see the challenge as something healthy and something that we should take on board? Well, obviously, you, you know where we would be going uh, with this. So. The fixed mindset is where the intelligence is fixed. It's not about your ability. Uh, it's a world of threats and defences. So fixed mindsets believe that intelligence is fixed, that you can't uh, change, you can't grow your IQ. Well, that's, that's, that's wrong. However, a growth mindset, which we're promoting, is where intelligence can be developed. Everything, challenges, efforts, setbacks, are seen as being helpful to learn and to grow. It's a world of opportunities to improve. So I guess what we're rewarding here is effort, the ability to, to persevere rather than the result itself. So yes, persevering and working through a challenge and a problem and getting to a result is very much worth rewarding. But so is that opportunity to try to ch take on that challenge and try to work around it with some different strategies. That's also what we should be re rewarding. It's the growth mindset. It's the idea that the students can develop their learning and their intelligence with your support. Giving up a fixed mindset proves nothing, uh, whereas a growth mindset creates that opportunity for challenge. Um, so when we emphasise people's potential to change, potential to change, we prepare our students to face life's challenges resiliently. So again, now we're taking the maths into the real world, so we're changing people's thinking, their mindset, their dispositions. Uh, so let's have a look at Sarah, um, and now we're going to move into some of these samples and have a look at um, some of the work that Sarah did and how she sort of perhaps structured these things. So what was her mindset? Did she have a growth mindset? Did she have a fixed mindset? And what would we be looking at as teachers? So um, here we are. Here's Sarah's work. She was asked to write these numbers in order, starting with the least. So 304, 301, 299, etc. Uh, you can see what Sarah's done. She's written 300, 301, 302, 303, 304, 305. So she's got that far. And then something's ha happened, pardon me, at 305. Things are broken down and she's got 298 and 299. How would you score that? How would you mark that in terms of her ability to uh, uh, complete the, the question that's been asked? It's not really a problem, is it? Uh, write these numbers in orders. Well, what has she needed to understand uh, to be able to do that piece of work? And of course, starting with the least, does she understand what least means in terms of numbers? And I think we're probably not talking about the least, we're talking about the smallest number. Anyway, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Here's another um, example. She was asked to break down 128 into 100 plus 20 plus 8. That looks pretty good. And uh, then she was asked to do this uh, addition sum, $873 plus 216. And good girl, she managed to get it right. So it looks like she's on the path. What would you say about her mathematical ability? She's been able to partition the numbers on the left hand side into 128. She's done that successfully. She's added up those two numbers, but she's had a little bit of a problem writing those numbers in order.
let's keep going. Oh, and there's one more, sorry. And of course, uh, here's a multiplication problem, 621 times three, and again, she's got that correct. So all in all, I think Sarah's working at a pretty good level. We don't know exactly what the, that level is until we get a little bit more familiar with the curriculum, but on the surface of it, we'd give that a, a bit of a star, wouldn't we? So let's have a look at uh, Sarah's counting. So she can count all the way up to 101 to 109, but her next um, element after 109 is 200. Seeing the pattern down below, 201, 202, 208, 209, 300. So where's her understanding lying? What's going wrong with Sarah? She knows that in the hundreds, once she gets to nine, in the units place, and this is around looking at not just quantities, but also place values, um, that it needs to go up by one. But instead of going from 109 to 110, she doesn't have that understanding. She hasn't perhaps had a concrete opportunity to develop counting to 109. Look at what 109 looks like in counters or in things we call multi-attribute blocks, MAB blocks, to look at what it looks like in a representational sense. So she knows it has to go up one after nine, but where's the one go? She puts that on the hundreds to the two to make it 200. And you can see there's a consistent pattern underneath the same thing, 208, 209. She knows it goes one more, but that one more is being increased in the hundreds uh, place rather than the, the units place. So yeah, there's a bit of work to do there. So that's come from her understanding there, or that's what we can presume. But of course, we're not really going to know until we sit with Sarah and we talk to her about what it is. How did she work out that top row? She's done very well. She identified 300 and then she goes really well up to 305. But of course, she got confused about the 298 and 299. And perhaps looking at that, she's written 298 and 299 down in that order because that's the order. Oh no, it didn't start with that, it's the blue. Anyway, um, so we need to interrogate Sarah's understanding a little bit more. We just can't see it on paper. We need to sit with her and ask her what she's done and ask her to show us what she's done. Let's have a look at how this uh, two additions went. 873 plus 216. Yes, she got uh, 1089, but have a look at how she's laid it out. Uh, again, we're talking about place values. And if you look at where the three dollars and the six dollars sit they actually if you look down that column um, she's got the eight of the 89 there rather than the nine now she's got it right because there's been no regrouping so three plus six is nine seven plus one is eight and eight plus two is ten so she's got this accidentally wrong because there's no regrouping and we'll talk more about regrouping in the class itself if you don't understand that term but basically what she's done she simply added the numbers in their order but without understanding the place value version of it so you can see how she's lined up the dollars nicely but not as she should be lining up the uh, the places themselves so again, while she's got the right answer, without interrogating what she's done, sitting with her or giving another couple of examples, we don't need to give her 100 examples, we don't need to give her 10, uh, that's overdone, just to make sure she's got the concept. But sitting with her and talking about how she's managed to do that, and we can see that she hasn't been able to line those up, but accidentally she's got it correct. Um, she doesn't mean she can read and write into the hundreds. Um, here we are, we, this is called partitioning. We're breaking it down again into the place values. So 128 is equivalent to 100 plus 20 plus eight. And it, she's got the right answer. She's been able to partition that three digit number, but it doesn't mean that she knows um, the actual place values and the magnitude of the numbers as with the previous example. So even though she can partition those numbers, does she have a strong and robust understanding of the place values? And what does 20 mean in that, 10, 20, that tens place? What does two tens mean? Does she have a really strong understanding? Again, we need to be able to sit with her and maybe just let her work through a couple more examples and possibly concretely as well. And the last one here, 621 times three, and again, she's got the correct answer, but does that mean that she can multiply a three digit number by a one digit number? Well, because again, there's no regrouping, once times three is three, 
2 times 3 or 2 tens times 3 is 6 or 60 and 6 times 3 or 6 hundreds times 3 is 18 or 1800 because there's no regrouping we can't be sure that she really is able to number uh, multiply a three digit number by a single digit number and again because she hasn't been able to align those um, numbers in their place value columns I'd suspect she's got that wrong uh, she's got it correct more by accident than by knowledge so we need again to sit with her offer a couple more examples but actually sit with her and see what she's doing we can't tell just from a piece of paper so while she got perhaps three of those four questions ostensibly correct looking deeper scratching the surface we know that there's possibly a little bit more work we need to do with Sarah to make to to ensure that her mathematics is is actually accurate so how do you now judge Sarah's mathematical ability are you seeing her through a fixed mindset where you um, are you seeing where she's going to go wrong and how you can fix it or are you seeing this through a growth mindset where you can see what she already knows and what she needs to know to further grow and improve and of course as we said she's got some really good understandings there she's got perhaps some misunderstandings that we need to work through so is it my job to fix it as a teacher that's the fixed mindset or is it my job to work with her set the base and reward her for what she already knows and then be able to use that knowledge to develop those next steps of the learning that is really the skills of a really good teacher being able to know what the student has been able to do and what those next steps to be able to grow their mathematical learning understanding is that's the skill of the teacher and that's what we're going to be working through in these next 13 weeks and indeed over your whole primary course or your early childhood course um, so when students are learning the mathematics uh, they use their existing knowledge and understanding to make sense of new ideas and that's really important because that's where we give the students the confidence to be able to take on new challenges by recognizing and rewarding if you like what they already know and then building upon that knowledge it's really hard um, and I'll use an analogy, analogy of a brick wall a bit like the, the picture on the right hand side if we don't have a strong foundation for mathematics if we leave holes in that wall that first part of the puzzle then eventually the mathematics as we build up into higher layers the mathematics will crumble so we've got to make sure the students have a strong base we recognize what they already know we recognize the base from which they're working and then we add the next steps of development on top of that um, some students do misunderstanding but it's seldom because they cannot understand it's often because they understand something else and we often we do now use this term misunderstanding we don't say the students are wrong we look for the misunderstanding we look where they not connecting previous learning to the new learning and we start from that misunderstanding we build on in a growth mindset and we take the students on the journey to develop their learning and in fact this is for the modeling that we'll be using for you in, in the tutes as well um, so seven messages to give a student in uh, in a maths class this is from a lady called Jo Bowler who's a wonderful mathematician we'll give you some links to her as well um, so everyone can learn maths to the highest levels again about disposition mistakes are valuable and yes we do champion and uh, we champion making mistakes we don't let students stop at making mistakes mistakes are communication and information for us we know that we haven't got to the solution that we want so we need to keep working around that and mistakes are really valuable in the feedback process um, and of course just going back to mistakes it's really important that you as a teacher practice and understand that as well that mistakes are valuable lessons questions are really important and I will always say and you've probably heard it before that the worst question is the one that's not asked so I make sure that in a tutorial or even in these lectures if there's anything you don't understand please ask there's no such thing as a silly question the worst question is the one that's not asked questions are really important again it's part of that feedback loop of being able to build your learning maths is about creativity and about making sense of your world it's about creativity it's not about it is about patterns I'll talk to you about that a little bit later but it's about being creative in that sense um, it's about connections and communicating and again the languages of mathematics are complex and we need to teach that directly so that the students can communicate the connections that they're making using appropriate language um, 
it's about learning and not performing. We're not creating a set of learning seals that can balance a ball on their nose in mathematics. It's about learning. It's about um, being able to be able to work through problems and resolve problems. It's being able to recognize what you can do and have an idea of what it is that you need to do in order to take those next steps forward. And here's the, the most important one for me, that depth is more important than speed. It's really important to teach students in a particular concept to a depth rather than trying to race through a curriculum. And the analogy I used before, if we're building a brick wall, we can't leave any holes, any bricks missing on that first layer of the brick wall because the second layer of bricks isn't going to be as strong. So we need to make sure the student's understanding is deep in the concept that they're learning to the level of ability to understand that, of course, rather than being pushed by speed to get through material simply because, oh no, we haven't taught this yet, let's get onto that. It's better that they understand at depth than Things at speed, we, don't, we cover shallowly and the students don't have a robust understanding. So those seven mindsets are really important from Joe Bowler. Everyone can learn to the highest level that they're capable of. Mistakes are valuable. Questions are vital. Maths is about creativity and making sense. It's about connecting and communicating. It's about learning, not performing. And it's about learning to a deep level rather than a fast level. And it's all about attitude. Again, disposition. If you feel good about maths, that's great. If you don't feel good about it, then suspend your feelings and allow new feelings to replace them. Be open to these new learnings, just like you want your students to be. Welcome them. Welcome the challenges that are going to be put in front of you. Um, and hundreds of students will tell you over time they've come to thoroughly enjoy teaching maths and working with primary maths. And I'm hoping by the end of uh, not just the uh, 13 weeks, but by the end of this lecture, even by the first tutorial, that you'll be excited about the opportunities that are in front of you around teaching and learning mathematics. Um, so no excuses, none of these. I'm not good at maths. I'm, don't, I'm a primary teacher. They don't need hard maths. I'm just EC. That's all rubbish. Um, between pre-primary and year 10, the most important learning areas are English and mathematics, literacy and numeracy. Uh, and if we get these right, everything else falls into place. Um, and, you know, one of the worst things you can hear as a teacher is if a parent comes in and they say to you, oh, look, so I was never very good at math, so I don't expect my child to be. You've got to cut that off right there and then because we don't want that child to carry the the, the parents' attitude towards maths into their own mathematical experiences. So make sure you've got some, some responses to that. Um, so again, it's all about the big D, the big D for disposition. Bring a positivity um, and a growth mindset to your maths learning and your maths teaching. Um, so you're going to be a teacher of mathematics. You need to be committed. And it's hard work. It's not easy. There's, there's no resiling from this. It's hard work to make sure that you uh, get it right for the student, students that you teach. It's not about beating yourself up if you don't. It's about understanding where you need to redo things or where you need to take them perhaps down a different pathway. You need to have an understanding of how you can be a mathematics, an effective mathematics teacher. And we're going to support you with that. Uh, you need to understand how do children learn mathematics. And we're going to support you with that as well. And you need to understand the mathematics you have to teach. And we'll be covering the curriculum elements of that. So um, pretty much all of that you're going to be getting from us. But you need to bring to your learning a positive disposition. Um, so in conclusion, uh, and as, as it says, it's just the beginning, really. Uh, it's you. That you're going to be responsible for the sort of mathematics attitude, knowledge, and skills that the students in your class will take into, your, into their life. It's your responsibility, it's a huge responsibility, but it's one that we can't underscore enough. Um, and I think I hopefully have nagged you so far that you understand what it is that I'm talking about. Um, so will you be a teacher who views maths as a way of thinking, a tool, a problem solving process central to learning in everyday life? Or will you be a teacher who thinks maths is just content and facts and procedures to be memorized? Well, obviously my hope is you'll be the former, because as the latter, uh, you won't be doing the best service you can be to the students that you're teaching. So here we go. That's the end. I'm sorry it's a little bit longer than what normally would be. I try to make these around a half an hour, 35 minutes, but the first one was really important to get through all of those particular elements. Thanks for your attention and your involvement. Enjoy your week. Most importantly, look forward to the, the first tutorial that's coming up. 
and uh, I look forward to uh, meeting my tutorial students on Thursday and the rest of you I'll see you again next Monday. Thank you.